In the back of our sanctuary hang two banners. If you want to turn around and take a look. The first one says, who is Jesus? And the second one says, why am I following Jesus? And to go along with Pastor Michael's children's message, you'll notice if you look closely on the banner of who is Jesus, there are very faint images of Jesus. And um, we can't tell what color hair, we can't tell a whole lot about him. And when we as a staff were putting that together, we wanted to make sure that those images um, didn't uh, seal in your mind what Jesus looked like, but gave you an opportunity to look at who is Jesus. In, we studied in 2012 the Gospel of Luke, and we, one of the most important questions that came out of a year-long study was the question that Jesus poses to each one of us. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? A teacher was giving her students a lesson in logic, and Here's the situation, she said, now there's a man who's standing up in a boat in the middle of the river and he loses his balance and he falls in. His wife hears the commotion, knows he can't swim and she runs down to the bank. Teacher says, now why do you think she ran to the bank? One child wildly raises his hand and he says, I know. I know, I know, she went to the bank to get his money. <laughs> now in our scripture passage from today, the disciples are faced with a similar situation. Like being in a class when the teacher asks an important question, they want to seem intelligent, so they blurt out answers. Not always the right one, but nonetheless an answer. This morning's test in our gospel reading began with that simple question from Jesus. Who do people say that I am? Oh, the answers were all over the place. Some say you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Others say you're Elijah. And still others say you're one of the ancient prophets, come back to us. Those answers were easy. The disciples had gotten the scoop from the crowd. They had heard what they were all chatting about. They had even polled their friends on Facebook. So they had those answers down pat. But then Jesus asked them the hard question. Who do you say that I am? Now I imagine that look of stunned silence 11 disciples kind of uh, looking at the ground thinking, mm, I don't know, until Peter finally piped up, well, you are the Messiah of God. You see, the crowd was identifying Jesus as the forerunner of the Messiah. John the Baptist, Elijah, the prophets, all of them were supposed to be messengers of a Messiah yet to come. But Peter said, you are not the forerunner of the Messiah. You are the Messiah. No more waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah is right here, right now, right in front of me. So that same question is posed to us. Who do you say that I am? That's the same question Jesus asks us. If you were asked to write a response to that question, what would you write? Who is Jesus for you? Ponder that. A man pulled up to a restaurant with some friends and there was a long wait People were sitting and standing all around the entrance waiting for their pager to go off to alert them that their table was ready. We've all been there waiting for that buzzer to go off. And after what seemed like a long time, it must have been a Friday night, the man barged up to the hostess stand and demanded to be seated. 
Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? He says to the hostess with his face right in hers. I ask you, do you know who I am? Shouted the man. The hostess calmly pressed the button on the microphone and said, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone. I have a gentleman here who doesn't know who he is. He asked me if I knew who he was, and I don't. So can someone please assist him in finding out who he is? Thank you. Jesus asks, but who do you say I am? And Peter responds, you are the Messiah. Jesus isn't asking the question to tout his self-importance like the man in the restaurant. Rather, he's asking the question to see if the disciples know what this means. Peter is exactly right when he says, you are the Messiah, a term which means anointed one, the divinely chosen leader of the people. And yet, getting those words right isn't all there is to being a faithful disciple. You see, Peter doesn't fully comprehend the extent of what he's saying. Jesus is very aware that many people are looking for a military Messiah, the command, God's commander-in-chief who's going to drive those Romans out of Jerusalem and restore that kingdom of Israel once and for all. So Jesus sternly orders the disciples not to tell anyone about him because he said, you know what? There are some things that need to happen first. And he started talking openly about the facts that he must undergo, undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, be, and be killed and be raised again. In the Gospel of Mark's version of this story, Peter quickly pulled Jesus aside and says, Hey, don't say that stuff. You're going to scare the people. But Jesus rebuked him. You see, it was inconceivable to Peter that God's chosen leader would have to suffer a humiliating death. But Jesus, being Jesus, quickly turned the table and set him straight, saying, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. It's obvious that Peter didn't grasp what being a faithful disciple was all about. Peter tried to behave like a patron, not like a disciple. You see, Jesus will not be patronized. Jesus challenged the disciples to look beyond the confession of belief. That invitation to follow was first extended to Peter and the three others beside the Sea of Galilee, but now, at this point, it is being refined in the shadow of the cross. Peter and the others must be asked again, if they really want to follow Jesus. That's the same invitation that Jesus extends to each one of us as we begin this Lenten journey once again. Jesus says to us, will you follow me? Will you be my disciple? Will you show that discipleship in your daily life to say yes? We need to move beyond confessing that Jesus is Messiah, to look at what is required of each of one of us as his disciple. Jesus says, first of all, you need to set your mind on divine things, not on human things. It's not about words we say or how we say it. It's how we feel in our hearts. And then what that moves us to do, how we act, as a response to our commitment. In an address to Yale University medical students, Father Richard Rohr said, you know, Jesus never once said, 
worship me. He said, follow me. Following Jesus will most likely mean that we need to make some changes in our lives. For each of us, the particular change we need to make is going to be different. But each one of them will be made at the foot of the cross. Today, when you came in, you should have received a simple wooden cross. And I'm sticking my hand in my pocket to get mine. Looks like this. If you didn't get one, there's a whole basket of them. Grab one. This is carved from one piece of Holy Land olive wood. And it's a reminder for each one of us that we take up our cross and follow Jesus. If you look at it, it's not a perfect cross. They all have a little bit of an odd shape, but it feels good in your hand. It's something you can rub your hand over. And it's a reminder to us also that we are never going it alone. We can put this cross in our pocket. We can hang on to it when we pray. That is when we pray that Lord's Prayer. Remember, we're supposed to be praying it at 6.09 a.m. For those of you who are up, or 7.09 or 8.09 or 9.09. depending on your wake-up time, and then again at 6.09 p.m. And 6.09 was chosen because the Lord's Prayer can be found in Matthew 6, 9. And you might say, well, I pray the Lord's Prayer all the time. But we're asking you to pray it and think about those words each time you pray it and think about the meaning. So you can be fingering this cross as you do that. We can hold on to it in times when things are great or times when things are tough. No matter where our journey takes us, to the top of a mountain or the depths of a funeral home, this is a reminder that Jesus will be with us and is with us. Jesus is not only one we meet here in this building on Sunday mornings, And then we leave behind when we walk out the door to go to work tomorrow or school. Following Jesus means we're followers every day, in every way. Henry Brinton, who is a pastor of Fairfax Presbyterian Church, got a letter in the mail along with a money order for $26.30. It was made out to his church and The letter said, Dear Reverend Brinton, I read a sermon of yours in the Washington Post. In it, you spoke of not playing it safe, not to punt when it is a fourth and one situation and to keep striving. To keep striving, that really spoke to a need in my heart. It encouraged me and the Lord spoke to me through your words. I was laid off from my job at the end of October. There are many needs in my life, or so it seems. But what I desperately need more than anything else is a closer walk with my God. About two months ago, the Lord told me to write and send the tithe on my unemployment check. It's taken that long to obey and stop listening to the voice in my head telling me how pathetic I am and to obey the one in my heart telling me it's okay. It's okay to obey. So I've enclosed a check for 2630. That 2630 is my tithe of that unemployment check, a down payment for me on a closer walk with God. Now, I don't believe that God requires a down payment on a closer walk. But for the writer of this letter, that's what it meant to faithfully follow Jesus. He made a sacrifice, an act of self-denial, a response to the invitation to take up the cross and follow him. As an aside, those of you who know how sports-challenged I am, 
I had to have my nephew-in-law explain to me what it meant not to punt on a fourth and one situation. <laughs> what will faithful discipleship look like for you or for me? It will be different for each one of us. Robert Fulgham, the author of that classic book, Everything I Learned in Kindergarten, Learned in Life, I Learned in Kindergarten, tells one of my very favorite stories. It's the story of Dr. Papaderos, who was one of his professors. He says his professor opened his wallet one day and pulled out a very small, round mirror. He said, when I was a small child during the war, we were very poor, and we lived in a remote village. One day on the road, I found a piece of broken mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place, and then I tried to find all the pieces, and I tried to put them together, but it was impossible. So I kept the largest piece. By scratching it on a stone, I made it round. And then I began to play with it like it was a toy. I was fascinated at how I could reflect light into dark places by the way I tipped the mirror. To places where the sun would never shine, deep holes and crevices and dark closets. He said it became a game for me to get light into the most inaccessible places. The professor continued, as I went about my growing up, I would take out that mirror in idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light or the source of the light, but light, truth, understanding, and knowledge are there, and it will shine in many dark places only if I reflect it. I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the dark places of the hearts of people, and I can change some things in some people, and in myself as well. Perhaps others might see and do likewise. Jesus said, if you want to be my followers, deny yourself, don't make your needs the most important, and take up your cross, do whatever needs to be done. Following Christ's example, as followers of Christ, we are not the light, nor are we the source of the light, but we are called to be reflectors of the light wherever we are. Hmm. What dark corner need you to be the reflector of the light. Amen.